Hello. Hi, Graham. Hello, Rooks, Hi. Magpies, and other Corvids. Welcome to Beside the Rookery, a special episode where I am getting the great honour of talking to Graham Davis about one of my favourite <laughs> oh, subjects on. and one of his favourite subjects, British folklore. Now, why are we talking about that, Graham? What is the occasion? Well, um, we are in the last 24 hours of a Kickstarter campaign for a mythic Britain and Ireland source book that I've written for the role-playing game Vesson. Uh, which uh, has done astoundingly well. Uh, last I checked, we're over $600,000. I don't know what that is in pounds or the original Swedish kroner, but uh, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. Um, the response has been amazing. Over 7,000 uh, backers on Kickstarter. Well, interestingly, our very first question, and we have had a lot of pre-submitted questions. I've been looking through them. I'm quite excited to get to some of them. I've brought props. Um, is how, from Kilishandra, mm -hmm. who is a regular in our questions section, very reliable in giving us a good intro question. So Kilishandra asks, how would you describe Vason to someone who had never encountered the game before? Okay, well, it's a tabletop role-playing game set in the 19th century or a, a version of the 19th century where folklore is real um, but still rare so it's about folklore isn't real Graham. <laughs> what? <laughs> well the uh, there is some debate about folklore being real in our world but in the world of Vesson it most definitely is and uh, so it's an investigative game um and uh yeah that's uh, that's pretty much all you need to know well no you do need to know that it is most gorgeously illustrated by Johan Egerkrantz who uh did a a book called this and a pure art book um which sets him alongside Brian Froud and Arthur Rackham as one of the premier artists of folklore it's absolutely gorgeous in the words of their own website let me just find it. Oh, that was terribly done. Vesson, Nordic horror role playing, is based on the work of Swedish illustrator and author Johan Egerkrantz. Vesson presents a dark Gothic setting steeped in Nordic folklore and the old myths of Scandinavia, and the game mechanics use an adapted version of the award winning zero, Year Zero engine. So there we go. There we so, are. What, what have we got coming up tonight? We've got lots of questions, and um, Graham will also be sharing a little gift for our patrons from him as relates to Vesson, and we will also be talking about a surprise for our patrons which we mentioned on That's Saturday right. um, and we will mention it again later on so to the next question where are we um right this is from Martin so what was the Vesson that just had to be in the book well they pretty much all had to be in the book because um, I, I started off with a, a long list of probably around 100 creatures, which clearly wasn't going to, to fit. Uh, had to whittle it down to about 10 in discussions with Johan. And the one for me, your mileage may vary, but the one for me that absolutely had to be in the book was the hag. There are hag legends from all over the British Isles and indeed all over Europe and probably the world. And um, there's so much to go there, go out there from um, <clears throat> interpreting them as uh, ancient goddesses with the birth of, uh, I'm going to get a little bit archaeological here, but, you know, in the Neolithic with the birth of farming, there's a, was a school of sort, thought that said the old Mesolithic hunter-gatherer Earth Mother religions were largely replaced by Sky Father religions because the weather was vital to farming. There's a whole lot of um, feminist scholarship and subtext about the uh, the hag being the personification of all that is unacceptable in a woman. Uh, there's just so many different angles to look at it from. And uh, also so many regional varieties. You go sort of 20 miles yes. in any direction yeah. and you've got yeah. uh, a different one. Here's a fun fact for you that I found mm -hmm. out when I was learning Norwegian and discussing all things etymological with my um, mm -hmm. Norwegian teacher. The word for midwife in Norwegian is jordmor, 
mm-hmm. which literally means Earth Mother. Oh, oh that, that is interesting. Yeah. Especially because another word for Earth is mid, as in Midgard, as in right. midwife. So does it come, it was presumed that it came from them being in between, but potentially a similar route. Your well, yes, yes. I mean, there's certainly touches on the uh, the subject of, of feminine knowledge handed down unofficially through the generations. Absolutely. And for Vesson fans, Graham, you'll be sharing later some extras in the crossover between Vesson and our patron. Um, right. So Zoltan has asked, Outside the books of Johann Eger Krantz, what other books would you recommend to someone who wants to know more about the old folklore? Um, well, um, I use quite a few. My go-to for British folklore is, uh, oh, now that's a nice one. <laughs> yep. Oh, don't forget Macbeth. Oh, no. No, indeed. Um, my particular go-to for British folklore is uh, an encyclopedia of fairies by Catherine Briggs. There are various editions of this. It goes back to the 70s, if not the 50s, and she is one of the really central figures of British folklore studies. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's really quite exhaustive. Um, there are others. Um, I put a bibliography in the uh, Mythic Britain and Ireland source book. And um, if you're interested outside the British Isles, I also, many years ago, wrote a GURPS source book on fairy lore from around the world. And this has an even larger bibliography with, uh, with sources from, you know, as far afield as Japan and Indonesia. The interesting thing about British folklore, especially the Scottish and Celtic traditions, is that mm. they were oral storytelling traditions. Oh, yes. I, I, like for a shonaki, I, I'm not sure if that's the right pronunciation, but that's the Scots word for it. Not sure on the Irish word. And unlike, and those are the same kind of traditions that were written down by the Brothers Grimm, by mm. Asbjornsson and Moe in Scandinavia. But Britain never really had a Brothers Grimm or an Asbjornsson and Moe. So some That's of these really books, some of these books, you probably, the, I read this to death when I was mm-hmm. um, a little girl, still quite small. Um, and this is all collections of Scottish travellers' tales from up and down the West Coast. And you're right, right. Graham, they completely varied from, mm. you know, travellers' groups to, um, yeah, to wherever you were, you would get a different flavour of the tale. But unlike right. the Brothers Grimm, which codified them into something yeah. that we all recognise, the Scottish, the British, the Celtic ones were never really codified mm. in the same way. No, no, they weren't. Um, Now, W.B. Yeats in the 19th century tried to do something similar for Irish law. Um, But uh, as far as Scottish and English, I'm really not aware of anything or or Welsh. Um, They were the stories were sort of collected here and there by travellers, as you say, often educated men, clergymen. Uh, frequently for some reason they also pioneered archaeology Um, but they were treated in a a sort of a condescending kind of a way as sort of rustic curiosities uh, as you know those amusing country folk and the things they believe Um, and uh, really until Briggs I don't think uh, anyone really tried to catalogue everything and, and take an overview i did see some comment that the her book is 250 pounds on amazon i don't know if it's still in print or not but uh it comes yeah, i was going to ask you that if it was yeah. easy to get hold of it comes and goes um back in the 70s penguin did an edition uh which was my first one which fell apart and i just replaced it about 10 years ago um but it, it, it does come and go, so keep an eye open for it. And you might find it on uh, on secondhand sources like a books or eBay as well. And this, of course, wasn't written by a Scot, but it was no. written in the time of um, James the Sixth and First and Indeed. has some elements of Scottish folklore in it and historical characters, some of whom Andy Law may be descended from. Um, oh. I'm, yeah, fascinating. Um, it, but the interesting thing about it for me is mm. the influence of James the Sixth 
um, oh, in very Scotland much. on witch burnings, and that's very topical because mm. there was just news today that they may be looking finally, after hundreds of years, to pardon um, so many of the innocent women who were burned, um, executed, and burned as witches for things that really were just superstitious. Yeah, um, or you know, you know alternative they, medicine. Yeah. Absolutely. Or the alewives who had yeah. many of the features of a witch and are now, it's thought that it was just a profitable industry and people wanted rid of the women who hitherto had run it. Hmm. Anyway, that's um, just a little bit of topical news from the world of witches. Scotland was particularly poor when it came to per capita um, witch executions, and yeah. especially where I'm from in the East Coast. Well, it was an obsession of James's. I, I remember when I studied Macbeth for English Lit at school, hearing that um, Shakespeare composed it uh, to celebrate the second printing, I think, of, uh, of James the first book, Demonology, which is um, kind of a horrifying read. It's, it's like a sort of a poor man's Malleus Maleficarum. Yeah, it is very much a manual for the witch finders of the time. Yeah. Yeah, or just being a bit outspoken and pushing against the Covenanters. That's another. That too, yeah. Um, so what is next? So another one from Kilishandra. What attracted you to write for Vesson and did the reality match your expectations? Well, um, the moment I saw Vesson, having been a folklore geek since a long time ago and a mythology geek long before that, um, I realized that Vesson was the game I didn't know I'd been waiting for, for many, many years. And I also knew that it needed a Britain and Ireland source book. Um, and I needed to write it. Uh, it was just like, yes, uh, got to do this. Um, and so what attracted me to write for it was that the fact that um, the game had proven a success with Scandinavian folklore. And I was thinking, well, you know, what could it do with, with uh, you know, British, English, Irish, Welsh, Scottish folklore? Um, it's, this has to happen. And it's set in the 19th century. Victorian Britain is an iconic setting. And you could introduce all sorts of, I mean, even Sherlock Holmes did some cases that appeared to be supernatural but weren't. And I think there's plenty of Sherlock Holmes fanfic out there where he actually does encounter the supernatural, um, you know, and it was just um, everything it was made me want to write for it and particularly to uh, to adapt it to Victorian Britain. And did the reality mix match my expectations? Well, my expectations weren't entirely reasonable because I had this long list of more than 100 creatures that I wanted to adapt. And, uh, <laughs> um, you know, poor, poor Johan would be drawing them until he was 90. So we had to kind of whittle that down. Um, and, uh, you know, there was only a certain amount of space in the book for adventures. I would have liked to have done a couple more. Um, but... Uh, but yeah, uh, I would say, you know, Free League were and and are because I'm still working on stretch goals. They're great to work with. Um, Nils Carlin and Thomas Harrenstam, uh, my main contacts there, and uh, Johan, of course. And it's uh, it's just been a great experience. I've really enjoyed it. Excellent. Um, a quick question now. You may not know the answer to this, um, mm -hmm. but Vicky, the GM, would like to know any plans that you've heard about an Icelandic supplement. I have not, but uh, I would look forward to an Icelandic supplement uh, enormously because, I mean, among other things, they have 20 different kinds of monstrous whale um, wow. in Iceland. And they have things like the Scoffin, which is a, a um, fox-cat hybrid. I can't remember which parent has to be which, uh, but it has a death gaze. And uh, there's, um, uh, oh, the Yule cat, that's seasonal. I don't know if you know this tradition or if the, you've encountered anything similar in Norway, but um, the Yule cat is a monstrous cat that stalks through the winter looking for people who aren't wearing their new best clothes in celebration for the holiday. And if they're not, it eats them. 
Wow. And uh, that's pretty judgy. It is. It is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, plus, of course, Iceland is is the home of the the Trauger, the sort of uh, uh, archetypal Barrow White, <laughs> the model. And uh, uh, yeah, so there's a lot yeah. to go out there. That would be a lot. Love of fun. in the comments for the Yule Cat. Mm -hmm. I can't. I I didn't realize the Yule Cat just simply um, was basically the fashion police. <laughs> basically, yeah. Yes, apparently it was very important that uh, that uh, everybody, especially children, received new clothes for Christmas and wore them in celebration of the holiday. So, yeah. in in many ways, it was out there oppressing the poor who couldn't afford new clothes. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's so awful. Yeah. Or oppressing. It's like if your mum gave you a winter coat and it was snowing, and you'd be like, "I I'm going to get hot, so I don't want to put my coat on." Yeah. So you would go out in the snow without your coat on, and then mm. you'd be in trouble when you came in and asked for hot Ribena. Um, right. Yes. It's the same kind of idea. Like if you don't put yeah. your nice new coat on, the Yule cat will get you. Yes. Yes. Or if you don't wear your ugly new Christmas sweater. Exactly. Do you like my Christmas mm. sweater? That's a very nice that's, one. Love that's that. a sel a traditional Selby rose pattern. Very nice. So, so yeah, uh, to answer the question, no, I haven't, but it would be great. That took a dark turn. Well, <laughs> yes. it, it, as folklore it, often does. Really, yeah, yeah. Um, are you guys a fan of the Cali folklore or Carlin, as she's known in the Northeast? Very much so. Yes, I've already sort of mentioned how the hag was one of the must-have monsters in the book, and um, well, uh, there's so much folklore there about that. Um, I've read a certain amount of it, particularly the uh, the Scottish. And uh, I actually went to college in the Northeast, so I've read a, a little bit about Carlin as well. And then you've got Jenny Greenteeth and Peg Powler and all of that. Um, so and the washer, the washer at the Ford is a particularly um, Highland Scots version. Very much so. Yes, yes. Some people lump her in with the Banshee, but I think that's just because of the Gaelic name. Um, yeah, she's a, she's like a Banni, I think is her name. Uh, yes, I don't know Banshee. how to pronounce it, but yeah. I think, it, I, I'm not sure, um, mm. Andy Leafs might know, because I know he's been studying Scots Gaelic, but it's Ban, Banni, something like that. Mm. Um, yeah, I used to be really terrified, because I used to go on holiday to the um, highlands of Scotland, from where I lived in the Grampians, in rural Scotland, and I didn't have a television, so, I mean, this is literally the book I used to read, mm. um, so it was, I was quite terrified by the local flora and fauna mm -hmm. and yeah there, there was a particular stream we had to cross and yeah i was always on the lookout for Afraid the washerwoman of... right ready to jump from stone to stone <laughs> absolutely yeah <laughs> no, even, no even jumping <laughs> like genuinely no no I'm i believe terrified it. by the washerwoman yeah the yeah. great gray man that was another one my oh, brother yes. and i um once um got herself up into quite a frenzy and ran all the way down a hill back to the cottage because we mm. had convinced ourselves that we had seen something walking in the distance yeah yeah there um, were some woods i had to walk through on the way to school when i was little and i had uh, similar uh, similar experiences <laughs> It didn't help that the cottage itself that we stayed in was very well protected. So it had a mm. round tree at the front gate and the back, the side gate, which nice. wards off witches. It was right next to a stream running water. And on either side of the doors, it had two mirrors embedded into the stone because witches can't look at their own reflection. So everything right. about this cottage screamed, former site of witch attack <laughs> must no take a of action. Yes, absolutely. Goodness me. Yeah. So here we've got one from Mr. Cultist. How many mm. books will come out this new Kickstarter? I see photo of two, but don't know if stretch goals will change this. Right. Um, definitely those two will come out in book form. I am not certain. This is a question for Free League, but I'm not certain whether the um, stretch goal rewards will all be added to the um, Mythic Britain and Ireland book or whether some of them will be... Uh, PDF only. Uh, that's that's really a question for them. 
absolutely. I should say that we are not free league. We just happen no. to have Graham in the rookery stable who has written for them. Um, and so we will direct you. I think Andy put the link in the chat um, to the Kickstarter for any questions that they yeah. might be able to help you with. Um, right. So how did you finally decide on which folklore creatures did make it in? Well, I had a long exchange of, uh, of emails with Johan Akerkrantz and we talked about, um, you know, I sent him a short list of probably 20 creatures and then we discussed those, the ones that would be, uh, be best for him to draw and uh, we kicked around. He is surprisingly knowledgeable about uh, the folklore of, of Britain and Ireland as well. He never once you know, even in a fairly obscure creature like the Nukalovi, he never came back to me and said, what? Um, he always seemed to know and to be able to talk about them knowledgeably. So we had a great conversation about them and decided between ourselves, I think, which, uh, which would go, which we'd put into the book, you know, how we'd cut the list down. Yeah, Vagrant456 says, I think the Kickstarter page is good with making it clear as to what is going into the books oh, and what is only a PDF edition. Mm. And Zoltan thinks most of it will be added in the two books, but latest bonus mystery will be in the PDF. Right, you are then. Good to know. So here's another question, a follow-up question from Martin. Are there any issues when adapting real-world folklore into a game setting? There can be, yes. Um, the main issue is um, variety, because as we've said, touched upon talking about hags, if you go 20 miles in any direction, a creature may have the same name or a very similar name um, and have certain core characteristics in common, but otherwise be completely different. Um, and uh, if you try and cover everything you end up with a, a list of abilities you know two pages or more which really isn't practical for a game source book and uh, so what i tried to do was to collect all the variants see what the common core of nature and abilities and attitudes and activities was right to that and then oftentimes I'd include a box with variants, you know, so talking about going back to the hags again, um, there's a core sort of hag description in the book. And then I've got a, a little box on uh, Black Anis and Peg Powler and Jenny Green Teeth and, uh, and the Calibur, I think, the, the winter hag of Scotland. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, just so the information's there if people want to use it and cover as much as I can without making it unmanageable. Um, Astra says the Nuklavi, I spelled that wrong, is probably the most horrifying thing. Can you tell us a bit more about it? You've peaked. Yeah. It, all right. It's um, It comes from the Orkney Islands and it's. I think it's a demon. Um, I think it was sent to punish the people for something. I'm not sure uh, without going back to my books, but um, it's sort of like a centaur. Uh, but it's twisted and demonic. It has a, a huge head with a single burning eye. It has no skin and Ew. it's blood. Its organs are visible. Its blood is, I can't remember whether it's black or yellow, but whatever's not the blood, the flesh is the other color. And uh, it's a horrifying thing. And it rampages around uh, blighting crops with its pestilent breath. And uh, sometimes it takes the form of a horse and rider. Sometimes it's a centaur shape, but it's always just one beast and uh sometimes i've read one account where it has a uh, a body as big as a killer whale an orca with a a suitable mouth right in the in the chest part before the uh, the human torso sprouts from that it's a crazy crazy thing wow just wow yeah that's much worse than a kelpie Oh, yes, yes. Kelpies are uh, uh, sweet natured ponies by comparison. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that stick you to their back and drown you. Right. Oh, and that's a, another thing worth talking about. Um, 
there was a lot of crossover between the mm. uh, the creatures in the original Vesson book, uh, you know, had counterparts in uh, in Britain and Ireland, uh, which is only to be expected since so many parts of the country were under Danish or Norwegian rule for so long. Yeah, um, I think Orkney itself was under a Jarl for, well, until ages. In, and, yeah, like, until Elizabethan yeah. times, I heard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. So, um, so there is a lot of crossover, and I was able to to write a section, you know, in, with a limited number of of creatures in the new creatures in the book. I was glad to be able to write a section with uh, here are things from the core book that uh, variants of which you'll find in Britain and Ireland, and and here's how to handle them. Yeah, in fact, I think the dialect of Orkney Norn, which I think the last recording was made maybe in the fifties. Mm. That was a branch of off old German, a Germanic language that branched off Old Norse, as right. opposed to that makes perfect sense. Yeah, um, yeah, Low German, which English kind of branched from, mm. which accounts for quite a lot of the dialect words that are still around up there, and also the naming practices. Oh like yeah, like Andrew literally comes from Thurso, which is like Thor's town or Thor's river or something. Right. Um. Oh. Given the season, if we went into Austrian folklore as a future supplement, does that mean we could finally get Graham's take on Krampus? I, yes, I expect so. Um, I don't know if we'll ever go into Austrian folklore, but uh, and we're very close to this Christmas. But perhaps for next Christmas, I'll uh, I'll tackle Krampus. Um, and Stephen Mercer says, just about to start my first Vesson campaign set in Scotland, Gothic Edinburgh is such a perfect base for the society. Oh, absolutely. It certainly is, yeah. Yeah, well, good luck with that. And I, I hope yeah. the book is useful to you. So, what happened to the monsters that didn't make the cut? And what does it mean for our patrons? <laughs> All right. <laughs> the very subtlest of segues. Um, yes. <laughs> I, I'm, st I'm still going to write them up. I've written up a couple already. Um, I've uh, been experimenting with the uh, Free League Workshop Community Content Program. I have a couple of things from, uh, I think, one from Denmark, one from Iceland up there on, on drive through already. Um, and I'm going to continue with all the monsters I couldn't fit in the source book. Uh, I'm going to write them up and th publish them through the Free League Workshop. And uh, what I'd like to do as well is offer them to our Patreon backers for free, uh, anyone who's interested in Vesson. There are still some details to be sorted out uh, regarding this, but that is definitely the intention. And uh, we'll let you know more uh, as we know it ourselves. Great news. Thank you, Graham. Um, and for our um, patrons, we've also got uh, a Christmas surprise. It may not be um, released exactly on Christmas Day because even um, the rookery need time off and all good crows need um, Father Christmas to come to them. Um, That's true. So, but we will be announcing what it is and then look out for it in your inbox. I'm not sure, Andy, um, definitely when it will be, but um, it will be a festive seasonal gift. for our It people. will be. Yes. Yes. It will be a, a little holiday present, if not quite in time for Christmas. Um, Zoltan says, Graham will write about folklore for any countries. A, patri a patron is citizen. Is that a surprise? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it oh, I... I, I wish I could make that promise, but uh, there's a lot of folklore in the world and a lot I still have yet to discover. Um, but I'm going to start with the uh, the creatures that I wanted to put in the Mythic Britain and Ireland source books, since I already have the list and uh, most of the research done. Absolutely. And um, the production team has just reminded me that the surprise is a RPG supplement and a custom emoji too. Very nice too. I had forgotten about the emoji. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're doing quite well with emojis, aren't we, with our, our custom set? Yes, for our Discord server. Yep. And I believe you can use it out with the server, is that right, production team? Just write a comment in the chat and help me with all this technical <laughs> <Yes>. nonsense. <laughs> 
<laughs> Usually Andy's here to tell all of all this. I'm just like, Andy, over to you. <laughs> but no, not today. I know. Um, so will the, I don't know how to the pronounce Barthes, that. Uh, Barthes? Unfortunately not. That's one of the ones that didn't make the cut. Um, uh, but uh, I was able to mention it a little as a variant on the black dog, which is, is one of the, the creatures that's definitely in. Uh, at least I think I was able to. Um, but it's definitely on the list for a, a coverage of its own. Thank you to our helpful viewers who have confirmed you can use emojis in different servers if you're a Nitro user. I knew there was something that people right. had to be. Excellent. I'm just checking if that brings us to the end of the questions that we had pre-submitted. Yes, we have talked about, um, oh, look, according to extra credits, there are charities that started to give the poor new socks so they could avoid the wrath of the Yule Cat. Oh, I love knowing that. <laughs> um, if there's any more questions, please do pop them in the chat. Um, you shared your favourite um, folklore creature, Graham, from Britain. Mm -hmm. I'll share mine. And it is the creature that's depicted on here. Can you see that? No, not very well. There we go. What's the... Which is a selkie. A selkie, yes. Um, they're in the book, by the way. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's a, a, a lovely story. Um, for those who don't know, why don't you uh, explain what selkies are? Well, I mean, there are lots of variants, as Graham said. Of course. But the but the the story that I first encountered them in is actually she's called um, a silky in that rather than a selkie, which is a regional variation. Salty the silky, and um, she was a seal, and most selkies are female seals, although you occasionally get a male one wandering around, um, who come on land or are caught by a fisherman who keeps their skin, and that means that they stay on land. Um, sometimes it's quite a delightful story of love, sometimes it's a little bit more coercive. Um, mm. I personally think that they were used as an oral storytelling tradition to warn people about the um, good behaviour in a marriage around a campfire, but um, who knows. <laughs> um, and if the if the fisherman treats the selkie well, then even she often pines for the sea, she might go back to the sea, but she'll return to see her children or to see the fisherman. Mm. If he treats her poorly, I've read a particularly horrific story where he cuts off her fingers so she can't grow back her flippers and get back to the sea. Um, mm. But eventually she does and her brothers come and he suffers the same fate. So yeah, it, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I haven't really explained this in a way that explains why they're like my favourites stories but um i i don't know i always loved the tales of the silkies and the selkies yeah yeah i was uh, up in the islands on holiday once and uh, went to watch some seals in a nearby bay and honestly they were watching me right back it was <laughs> you can definitely understand why people um ascribed human levels of intelligence to them um, yeah the nicest stories are the ones yeah. where um in fact, this one in in this book um, is a beautiful story about co-parenting after mm -hmm. a divorce. So essentially, oh. Salty the Silky pines for the sea so much. Mm -hmm. And in the end, her partner says to her, you know, please, you must go back. You must go back to the sea where your family is, where you're from. Mm -hmm. um, and they share the parenting of the children. So she right. takes the children, you know, like for part of the year and then she drops them back with him on land and then she takes them again. And it's just a really, I think, a beautiful tale of, yeah, shared co-parenting. It's lovely. That, that is nice, yes. And I've, I've read that uh, a lot of... Um, a lot of people who are highly skilled fishermen are said to have silky blood that... Uh, you know, those with a selkie mother inherit uh, skill in, in fishing and uh, other associated tasks, which is kind of nice. Yeah. There's also, I don't know how, obviously this is will never be known, but mm. there's also some belief that potentially the root of the selkie myths is where two peoples met mm. and the peoples from the north wore 
fur because it was seal fur right. um, and the peoples who were coming from the south obviously didn't have access to seal fur and so that is something about like a, a memory of encountering mm -hmm. those people and especially if you think about so many of the selkie myths are about two different kinds of people meeting and coming yes. to an accord yeah. or being punished if they don't come to an accord right. um, you know it maybe has a, a ring of truth about it yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, it's a, a fairly uh, common theory in, in myth and folklore worldwide. I've come across more than once that, um, you know, it's the, the animals are totems of, uh, of particular peoples and it's a metaphorical form of the interaction between the peoples that we're actually yeah. reading about. Yeah. I, yeah, and, and the other thing for me is, especially these ones, these were, as I said at the start, oral travellers' tales. Mm. And, and so I do think that they functioned as a way to teach communities oh, yeah. and young people about ways to live, because where else yeah. would you get those messages across? You can't literally just sit there and say, you know, yeah, no, if you put them in a story, they have much more impact. And I, yeah, I think that's absolutely. been accepted as as fundamental in folklore studies, that one of the sort of sociological functions of folklore is the transmission of social values. Yeah, absolutely. You know, hence the hag being everything that society considered undesirable in a woman, for example. Yeah. <laughs> a selfie with a selkie. Mm. That's nice. Yeah, I'm a bit obsessed with the selkies. So Wendigo, yes, it would be nice to get into North America as well. Yeah, that's something I'm not at all qualified to. Mm. I, I had occasion to uh, to look into North American kind of everything, uh, myth, folklore from uh, colonial as well as native, and uh, going up into the into the. Uh, urban myths like the Jersey Devil and that, uh, when I was working a few years ago on a game called Colonial Gothic, which was sort of very similar to the uh, Johnny Depp Sleepy Hollow movie in sort of feel, another horror game. So uh, yeah, that would be, uh, I wonder if there would be interest in a North American setting for Vesson or whether uh, people would consider that it has to be in Europe, it has to be old worldy. Be an interesting question. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing I was thinking about folklore recently was when we were in Thurso in November for a wedding, and I've never been up north uh, where, you know, the Atlantic meets the North Sea mm. um, during such a stormy time. Um, it was Storm Arwen, and it, oh no, it was just before Storm Arwen, and it was so windy that our train actually had a speed limit all the way down the East Coast. Mm. Um, but I just we were walking along um, the shore and the sheer might of the sea was absolutely just awesome in its most yes. literal sense of the world. I couldn't mm. even comprehend it. Mm. And it really struck me that so many of the stories that I read, like the Selkie who comes from the sea, or so many of the stories that come from the fishing villages, or mm. the coast of Scotland is such a long coastline and so oh, vastly yeah. populated that you could completely imagine personifying that when so many people depended on it for their livelihood, but also for their lives in that weather. Yeah. yeah. Oh, definitely. And, and one of the things, um, the copy of uh, James, going back to James the sixth slash first, um, the copy of demonology that I read had the case of the Berwick witches uh, bound in with it, which was uh, allegedly an attempt to assassinate James by 13 covens of Scottish witches, a coven of covens, um, who attempted to raise a storm while he was at sea. And uh, talking about, you know, the might of the sea that way, you think you think a storm, okay, you know, if you've not seen what you've seen. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it could be almost the fury of hell let loose in the form mm -hmm. of water. Because what didn't his wife, to be, die on her way here, the Danish... Oh, and his, him, yeah. Yeah, his yeah. Danish wife to be died, and a woman so, was yeah. tried and executed for calling up a storm, which she confessed to under torture. Obviously. As you would, yeah. Yeah, as you would. Um, 
yeah fascinating yeah um this is yeah my child this is andy law my childhood in a nutshell the sea is never to be underestimated especially amongst the fisher communities oh i've no doubt of that um and in the in other areas of britain um is the second sight or as big a feature as it is in like northern scotland the highlands and islands um it's definitely present and it's definitely significant um whether it's as prevalent that's a really tough question to answer um i would say probably not because there are things which are um there are formulae for gaining it which makes me think that it's not so uh widely encountered by through birth um, yeah interesting but, but the seventh son of a seventh son would still be a, a I believe thing so, yes. in other parts of Britain. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. 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 I'm fairly yeah. certain Andy Law had a teacher who was from a crofting family who mm. either the gran or the mum was rumoured to have the second sight. So you're talking in the 80s. It was yeah. still in conversation. Oh, yeah. Enough in yeah. school you know in schools in rural scotland that it was a thing mm. still oh yeah i mean definitely in in 1960s london among the uh, the older generation the generation of my uh, older aunts uncles and grandparents there was talk of you know people who who saw things or knew things and um so yeah it uh, it was around but it perhaps it wasn't was. so much a part of the uh, this is black. The interesting thing about it in those Highland communities is that they were also extremely religious. So right. there was kind of this crossover of folklore and the traditional belief in the second sight at the same time as being um, mm. very Christian. I can't remember what church it would be, Church of Scotland, We Freeze, a Presbyterian church, but yeah, mm. very much. And of course, yeah. in the Western Isles, still Roman Catholic to a certain extent. Right, right. Yeah. Which is quite an unusual lasting of folklore and Christian religion that you don't see in that many places. Um, well, yes and no. It's one of these things that um, they kind of throw each other into relief. And um, it's, it's as though you can't really uh, do without uh, the folklore just because you have a very strict Protestant sect. Um, I've been a, a lot of the swedish fairy tales that i've read in translation um it's the village priest who takes uh care of the problem but not by conventional means there's this sort of um this sort of euphemistic formula uh which gets repeated again and again it's like he knew more than his our father if you take my meaning you know, so he was a learned man and maybe he'd read some forbidden books or uh, he, he knew something, but uh, it was something that the church wouldn't approve of was the means he used to lay the ghost or do whatever he did. Yeah. And as um, in the, uh, the thousand references to the deal everywhere. Oh, everywhere. Yeah. The devil for those that mm. do not understand the Scottish vernacular, often mixed with wolves until they were wiped out. Of course. Yeah. I always forget mm. the wolves, beavers, bears yeah yeah and and i think scotland well scotland and ireland both have uh wolves werewolves wolf people who are actually quite nice and sympathetic the the scottish wolver i've read helps people with fishing and uh can oh, really be, be very nice you know they can be very good neighbors if you're good to them and um in ireland in county ossery i believe it is there's a long tradition going back to the middle ages of um people uh who usually um oh it goes back to saint patrick i remember now the the crowd shouted him down with wolf-like howls so he cursed the community so that uh for a certain period of time everybody had to live as a wolf in oh, wow. their life and um centuries later a, a welsh missionary i think it was encountered a pair of them a husband and wife where uh she had been uh, been injured and uh 
unzipped her her wolf skin to show her human hand with the injury in it and he blessed it and and bound it and everything and got a blessing from the wolves it's really quite charming stuff yeah quite a lot of the of the skin changers of folklore are literally that aren't they like yes. literally taking off the skin and you can put the skin somewhere and yeah. then yeah put it back on or the skin can be like in the selkie myth the skin can be hidden from you so you can't assume your that's true right. form or your different form yeah 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 and in 15th century germany had i mean there were various kinds of werewolves and i could talk your ear <laughs> off about that but there was one kind where um it was basically sorcery you enchanted a wolf skin needn't be a whole skin could just be a belt but uh, whenever you put it on you change shape fascinating mm -hmm. i could definitely listen to a treaty treaties on um different kinds of werewolves <laughs> vagrant says it explains oh what you were saying earlier explains a lot about the priest we met in our vixen game uh -huh. mm -hmm. good stuff Excellent. Well, thank you for joining me today, Graham. That oh, pleasure. Been... Oh, we've got another question coming. Oh, oh we do. Uh, what vessel <laughs> will you talk your way with and which will you run or shoot on sight? Oh, boy. Well, running and shooting don't always work. Um, be sure to wear a coat with silver buttons because you can put them into a muzzle loading musket and they have been proven, especially if you scratch a cross in the top before you fire it. Um, but they've been proven uh, efficacious against all manner of supernatural foes. Um, running, they love that. They'll run you off a cliff or into a bog or they'll just run you around a maze like uh, the, the Cornish pixies do. And, um, but, um, Fairies of most kinds, provided you don't, uh, you watch what you say and how you say it, uh, can be uh, talked with. Um, you can't necessarily talk your way out of anything. What you can do is prove you know the etiquette and you're showing proper respect. Um, and that's probably the best you can hope for. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and Vagrant says, I forget the book now, but it traced the path from religion to folklore to fairy tales told by Granny. That, yeah, that is a, a enduring strand in folklore studies. Yeah. Um, some people have kind of set out to find links back to old religions that they've reconstructed on the basis of the fossil traces in folklore. And that's a little bit dodgy academically, um, but it's fun for games for sure. I'm quite fascinated by, um, I can't think of the word for it, it's like archaeological linguistics, mm. you know, where you go backwards in the words and, and they reconstructed oh, right, yeah. the Proto-Indo-European, it's not archaeological linguistics at all, but it's got a name. <laughs> something linguistics right. it I'm might it might just be archaeo linguistics yeah something like that yeah i'm really interested in that as mm. maybe the head the hidden thing but that, that shows where those roots really come from like it yeah it is it, it's etymology but it's also there's definitely a word for it that mm -hmm. in linguistics not just etymology um and I, I'm quite fascinated with that and what that might reveal about some of those folk tales. Yes, definitely. You know, I, until I encountered Yordmore as midwife, but actually meaning Earth Mother. And when I said it to my Norwegian teacher, she was like, oh, like I didn't even think of that because to right. her, it's just the word for midwife. Just like yeah. we don't think of the word for midwife as mid and wife. It's just midwife, someone who delivers yeah. babies. Mm. And so whereas I had often heard Earth Mother, you know, like in that kind of hippie 60s Earth right. Mother vibe, but in a different language, it meant a completely, uh, an actual profession. Yeah. Like, that is fascinating. Like where, mm. where is the nexus of those and how much more is there hidden in language that can tell us yeah um you know why little red riding hood why snow white you know why yeah uh, i want to know the why and, and go right back and i think language will be 
I'm like I'm a bit suspicious about artifacts being able to tell us anything about that because every single right. artifact that they ever uncover, they say it must have been for ceremonial use until they realize <laughs> I don't know. Well, as a that, as a former archaeology student myself, that was a sort of a running gag, particularly in prehistoric studies. It was uh, yeah, if you didn't understand what a thing was, it was clearly ritual. Yeah, clearly ritual. <laughs> because you didn't yeah, want then, to admit that you hadn't someone, a clue. Yeah, and then someone comes in who has traditionally not been part of the field say and it's like yeah but that's mm. just actually like something that i would use to spin wool or yeah. you know the one of the very first um things that they found that might be a calendar is like a stick marked with 28 notches and they're like oh this is like man's first attempt to mark the passage of time and mm. i think the lady giving the lecture is like yeah but actually like who actually would have a use for marking the passage of 28 days would it be a man or could it have been a woman <laughs> it could possibly have been a you know, woman like, yeah yeah you know why might they have needed to mark you know there there is a logical explanation for oh, yeah. that before yeah. agriculture is a thing even right and yeah and I, I think it's fascinating as to see the intersection of different um fields as they and, and that's why in a, a role-playing um, company like ours, diversity of thought and diversity of background is so important because we all bring mm. different things, like we were talking oh, with yeah. B the other week. That's right. And yeah. uh, another advantage to having a head full of all the stuff that my head is filled with and yours clearly is too and everybody's is to an extent, is that within the context of a game, we can play with it and you know, make it into whatever we want. And we don't have to prove anything academically because <laughs> it's mm. just a game. Yeah, exactly. That is the beauty of writing, uh, yeah. of, of writing an RPG. My daughter was saying to me today, actually, she said, people are reviewing the new Spider-Man and the Spider-Man, <laughs> that's a standing <laughs> joke between me and someone at work that uh -huh. Spider-Man is like a, a lawyer in New York who plucky stands up for the poor. Um, yeah, nice uh, Spider-Man, the new Spider-Man movie, um, and it reads like it was written as fanfic. And I'm like, but if you think about it, it is mm. fanfic because the oh, people yeah. writing Spider-Man today are the kids of yesterday who were reading it. So exactly, how is that not fanfic? It's just fanfic you've been paid to write. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's that's the story of my career. You know, I started mm -hmm. writing game stuff. Uh, as a fan, a few things got published. I took the money and bought some beer and wrote more. And then eventually I got a job actually inside the industry. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, and I think we've talked about that before mm. on Inside the Rookery and a little bit um, in our um, streams before that about how that's how a lot of people um, did it. What did I say? Inside the Rookery. Did I say you it did, wrong again? Did. As always. What no, did I say? No, it's in inside the rookery is the Saturday one. This is yeah, beside yeah. the rookery. So I yeah, think so we've right. talked about it on both. Yeah. Hmm. Um about how many of us started um as fan amateur amateur creators. Yeah. Well, I mean you 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 can't not, you can't come from yeah. knowing nothing and caring nothing about games to just writing for them. It's uh, it doesn't work that way. So, the best life, says Astra, being paid for fan fiction. Absolutely. Can't complain. I think that Fifty Shades of Grey started as fan fiction for Twilight. Or, I or maybe believe the other that's around. true. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> that's, that's what I heard too. Uh, yeah. But, you wow. know, you can't get a coconut with every throw. <laughs> um brilliant so thank you graham for joining me on this rambling tour well which, thank you for having me no problem at all somewhat characterizes our weekly meetings that people don't get to listen to because thankfully we don't record them <laughs> <laughs> i'll just remind everyone of um the kickstarter link mm -hmm. for um and mythic britain and ireland check. it has currently i think I'll 24 hours to go just yeah. In the screen. Yes, 24 hours still to go. 24 hours to go, still to go. So um, get on there and back it. Um, Aaron P. Church says, thank you for such a wonderful trip. Is it Aaron? Oh, Aaron Upchurch. I read that's wrong. I thought your middle name began with P, like Peter. 
<sighs> I just should well, try to you. read. Thank you for being interested. Things, but thank you for being interested in our our folklore in chat. Instance. Yeah. Um, and there is our Discord link if you'd like to join our community. Yeah. Um, excellent. Well, um, thank you very much, Graham, for joining me. Thanks, Andy, for um, being in the background on production. And thank you to all our viewers who joined us live. And if you're watching us on YouTube afterwards, please do remember to like and share. Yeah. And we will see you all um after our festive break yeah Thanks. and while you're doing that uh do go to our patreon link and consider helping us uh s support us in producing all these uh, streams that we do indeed very well said thank you graham yeah. bye, bye see you soon